Once the first white man stepped onto the North American shores, the American Indian people were thrown into a struggle for their very survival. The onslaught of Europeans seeking riches and land grew into a government bent on the destruction of the Indian people who stood in their way. Through it all, our people sought to preserve the ways of our grandfathers and grandmothers. And although they were ruthlessly pursued and oppressed, ours was the ultimate triumph, the triumph of the native spirit. Had the Indian been as completely subdued in spirit as he was in body, he would have perished within the century of his subjugation. Standing Bear, Ogallala, Lakota. The story of the first people is as vast and complex as the land upon which it is written. From the Atlantic to the Pacific, from the Gulf of Mexico to the Arctic Circle, deep in the eastern woodlands and across the parched southern deserts, to gentle hills, endless prairies, and icy mountain peaks. The American Indian tribes thrived for thousands of years before the coming of the white man. Hear me, my friends, for it is not the time for me to tell you a lie. The Great Spirit made us, the Indians, and gave us this land we live in. He gave us the buffalo, the antelope, and the deer for food and clothing. We fought our enemies and feasted our friends. Our old men talked with spirits and made good medicine. Our young men herded the horses and made love to the girls. Where the teepee was, there we stayed, and no house imprisoned us. No one said, to this line is my land, to that is yours. In this way, our fathers lived and were happy. Red Cloud, Oglala, Lakota. Many Eastern tribes felt the devastating effects of the Europeans' arrival almost immediately. The white man brought diseases which swept like a poisonous wave across the country. Many tribes were decimated by the new diseases. Some were entirely wiped out within just weeks. The disease that our people didn't have immunity to here on this continent that was brought from other continents even preceded those people before those people even came in contact with tribes out west when they first arrived on the continent in the east. Those diseases were given to those tribes and when those tribes would trade with other tribes that disease just swept across the country and it wiped out whole tribes and some tribes there was just a few people left and it was devastating to our people. Over a period of 200 years more and more Indians were killed by war with the settlers while being pushed ever westward. When you look at everything that was against them, it's, it's really a wonder that our people are still here today. Um, the disease, the, the government, the United States government actually had bounties 
on Indian people's heads. You know, there were, were governmental policies later that tried to get rid of us or take our land from us. In 1820, the U.S. government began offering treaties with Indian tribes east of the Mississippi River, which gave them land in the unsettled Southwest Territories if they sold and vacated their ancestral homelands. This resulted in an estimated 100,000 American Indians leaving the United States territories and migrating in arduous journeys across the Mississippi River to what was then called Indian Territory. Thousands of Choctaw, Chickasaw, Seminole, Cherokee, and Creek died of disease and hardship as the men, women, and children were forced to walk up to 700 miles in hopes of finding peace in a strange new land. The final battleground between America's native people and the invading adversaries took place in the land of the American West. On the high plains, the Indians made their last stand as a free people. The history of their struggle against complete physical and cultural domination is a series of tragic events that represents the wider saga of nearly all Native Americans. From the Seminoles in the southeast to the Inuit of the far north. In the mid-1800s, settlers had begun to swarm into the Western Indian Territories and the U.S. Army trained special troops whose sole purpose was to terrorize the remaining free Indian population into submission and to force the surrender of their lands. Damn any man who sympathizes with Indians. I have come to kill Indians and believe it is right and honorable to use any means under God's heaven to kill them. Colonel John Shivington. Even those bands who did submit were not safe from the violence by the army. Some tribes who had made peace treaties with the army were still the victims of brutal massacres. The Sand Creek Massacre is just one of many stories of U.S. Army treachery against our people. Two Cheyenne chiefs, Black Kettle and White Antelope, signed a peace treaty with the U.S. Army in hopes that they could protect their bands from the continuous wars. They were assured that they no longer had anything to fear from the U.S. Army. But... On a bitterly cold November morning in 1864, Colonel Shivington's troops appeared at dawn at Black Kettle's and White Antelope's camp at Sand Creek, Colorado, as the families lie in their teepees, secure in the knowledge that they were under the white flag of peace from the U.S. Army. I heard shouts and people running about from the camp. From down the creek, a large body of troops was advancing at a rapid trot. I looked toward the chief's lodge and saw Black Kettle had a large American flag tied to the end of a long lodge pole and was standing in front of his lodge holding the pole. Then the troops opened fire from two sides of the camp. The women and children were screaming and wailing, the men running for their lodges, for their arms, and shouting advice and directions to one another. White Antelope saw the soldiers shooting the people. He did not wish to live any longer. White Antelope stood in front of his lodge with his arms folded in front of his breast, singing his death song. Wearing the peace medal he had received from President Lincoln, White Antelope was shot dead as he stood before his lodge, watching heartbroken as more than 150 Cheyenne and Arapaho, mostly women and children, 
were butchered before his eyes, their bodies mutilated. They finally withdrew about five o'clock. As they retired down the creek, they killed all the wounded they could find. Many who had lost their wives, husbands, and children or friends went back down the creek and crept over the battleground, over the naked and mutilated bodies of the dead. Few were found alive. The soldiers had done their work thoroughly. George Bent, Southern Cheyenne. The happiest days of my life were spent following the buffalo herds over our beautiful country. My mother and father and goes ahead, my man, were all kind, and we were so happy. Then when my children came, I believed I had everything that was good in this world. There were always so many, many buffalo Plenty of good fat meat for everybody. Pretty Shield, Apsaroka. As the Plains Indian Wars dragged on into the late 1800s, the U.S. government looked for a way to finally subdue the hostile tribes and force them onto the reservations. They saw that the buffalo gave our people food, clothing, and hides to make their teepees. Without the buffalo, the Indian resistance would die. They knew that warriors who would not surrender in battle would have no choice but to lay down their weapons when they saw their wives, grandmothers and children sick and dying. They had their solution. The government would encourage buffalo hunters to slaughter literally tens of millions of buffalo in order to starve the tribes onto the reservations. The buffalo hunters have done more to settle the vexed Indian question than the entire regular army. Let them kill, skin, and sell until the buffalo is exterminated, as it is the only way to bring lasting peace and allow civilization to advance. General Philip Sheridan. I can remember when the bison were so many that they could not be counted. But more and more, Washichu came to kill them until there were only heaps of bones scattered where they used to be. The Washichu did not kill them to eat they killed them for the metal that makes them crazy. And they took only the hides to sell. Sometimes they did not even take the hides. They just killed and killed because they liked to do that. Black Elk, Oglala, Lakota. 50 million buffalo roamed this land before the white man came. By 1890, when the last tribe surrendered onto the reservations, there were fewer than a thousand buffalo left scattered across the plains. The savage extermination of the buffalo and the degrading conditions of reservation confinement led many a young man to think it would be better to die fighting than to submit. We took away their means of support, broke up their mode of living, their habits of life, introduced disease and decay among them. And it was for this and against this that they made war. Could anyone expect less? General Philip Sheridan But our warriors faced a seemingly unending number of soldiers who were equipped with weapons of unimaginable killing power. 
The Indian could hold his own against an equally armed adversary, but he could not withstand the onslaught of soldiers and their powerful new weapons. For the first time, the plains warriors were facing repeating rifles, cannon and gatling guns, which killed scores at a time. The tribes could not survive the mounting toll of warriors killed. The old ones and children grew weaker and more helpless. With time, the great tribal leaders felt the heavy burden of protecting their people, and so they submitted in hopes that the children might survive and their people live on. The people were desperate from starvation. We felt that we were mocked in our misery. We held our dying children and felt their little bodies tremble as their souls went out. It left only a dead weight in our hands. Red Cloud, Oglala, Lakota. A nation is not conquered until the hearts of its women are on the ground. Then, no matter how brave its warriors, nor how strong their weapons, it is done. Cheyenne Proverb. Not satisfied with the confinement of the Indians on the reservations, the government sought to forcibly destroy the culture of our ancestors. Various laws prohibited the performance of all traditional spiritual ceremonies or any cultural expressions in hopes that the Indians would abandon those ways to become second-class members of a white society. Under this yoke of oppression, the ways of the grandfathers and grandmothers were in peril of being lost forever. You know, our, our ceremonies, our songs and our prayers is about life. It's about how sacred things are and trying to live a beautiful, sacred way of life. For although our people were weary and trapped, the spirit of the Indians still burned within the smoldering embers of our destroyed camps and broken hearts. I am 91 years of age now. And I was brought up by my grandparents, Yellowtail, and his wife, Lizzie Yellowtail. And it was only about, oh, about 30 years when the, uh, the crows were moved to this part of the reservation, and reservation life started actually in 1884. They were settled here, and the Secretary of Interior issued Secretary's Orders of 1884, prohibiting the Indians from practicing all uh, activities related to their culture, you know, dances, powwows, and singing, and, uh, uh, and things like that. So, they, they were afraid to even put on their native costumes they were told to wear over a white man that would start becoming a white man. Simultaneously, almost every Christian denomination opened churches on or near the reservations and actively tried to convert our people away from our own traditions. On the Crow Indian Reservation and the reservations of many other tribes, each family was arbitrarily assigned to become a member of one of the churches. What has happened to indigenous people historically 
uh, with not only federal government policy, but also the role of churches uh, stripping us away from our, our normal religious traditions and cultural traditions. By that I mean missionaries coming to our reservations or trying to find us and converting us away from our Indian ways. So it's been very, very difficult to continue to hang on to those traditions. The white man's wise one said that we may have the religion, but when we tried to understand it, we found that there were too many kinds of religion among white men for us to understand, and that scarcely any two white men agreed which was the right one to learn. This bothered us a good deal, until we saw that the white man did not take his religion any more seriously than he did his laws, and that he kept both of them just behind him, like helpers to use when they might do him good in his dealings with strangers. These were not our ways. We kept the laws we made and lived our religion. We have never been able to understand the white man who fools nobody but himself. Antiku, Absaroka. The wrenching cultural transition into a new and bewildering world of reservation life put the spiritual heritage of the Plains tribes in peril. Their intentions were to help the Indian people to become more a part of the melting pot of America. And so they wanted to teach Indian children not to speak the language, to not be a, in, a part of the ceremonies, to turn away from all of these things so that they could become a part of the rest of American society. And it was real detrimental to our people because that's who they were and that's what they were. And by teaching them that those things weren't good was basically telling them that they weren't good. And so it, it, it was real devastating to our people. Yet many men and women of the pivotal first two generations of reservation life held fast to the spiritual legacy of our ancestors. Many old great warriors who participated in the Plains Wars were now living on the reservations but still secretly practice the traditional spiritual ways. With this sacred pipe, you will walk upon the earth. Every step that is taken upon her should be as a prayer. All the things of the universe are joined to you who smoke the pipe. All send their voices to Wakantanka the Great Spirit. When you pray with this pipe, you pray for and with everything. Black Elk, Oglala, Lakota. We participate in the sweat lodge ceremony throughout the year to prepare ourselves for the sun dance. So it is an important part of the sun dance religion. When a person has the proper intention and observes all of the rules, the sweat lodge purifies the person not only on the outside, but also throughout his inner being. Perhaps the most important reason for lamenting is that it helps us to realize our oneness with all things. To know that all things are our relatives. And then, in behalf of all things, we pray to Wankantanka that he may give us knowledge of him who is the source of all things, yet greater than all things. Black Elk, Oglala, Lakota. The first generation that grew up on the reservations recalled seeing the old warriors as they sat around the campfires 
and performed sacred ceremonies. Those old ones made profound impressions upon the young children. When they danced in the warrior's way, and then gave their war hoops and shot their rifles into the air, we children were certain that we had seen the end of our days and whoosh, did we run for cover. We would hide under the blankets or behind something and just peek out to see those tremendous leaders until another shot came out and we dove for cover again. The U.S. government knew the key to assimilating the Indian people into the white culture was the children. Even when confined to reservations, the government saw that young American Indians were still greatly influenced by their traditional elders. So they literally ripped the children from the arms of their mothers in hopes of breaking the children's attachment to their heritage, language, and way of life. The Secretary of Interior's order of uh, detribalizing the Indian people and making them <laughs> into white men as soon as possible, unilateral uh, uh, assimilation process. And uh, one of the first things they want to do is establish a school, a boarding school. And the boarding school was set up there uh, about 1890, I think, in Crow Agency. Boys' dormitory, girls' dormitory, and uh, dining room and uh, classrooms, other <coughs> facilities right, right, right at Crow Agency. And the Crow children were required to be taken to that boarding school and left there. The reservation children were forcibly taken from their homes and confined to government boarding schools. At those boarding schools, the government utilized many tactics in their attempts to destroy the Indians' ancient ways and sense of identity. In 1879, the founder of the Carlisle Indian Boarding School Richard Henry Pratt, explained that the school's purpose was to kill the Indian and save the man. In my grandmother's generation, they were taken from the home. Um, and if the parents didn't send their kids to school, they were arrested. And the police would actually come out to the homes and, and take the kids from, this, from their homes and take them to the boarding school. Yellowtail was uh, just five years old. His little old grandmother, there stays by the side of the water. That's her name. <laughs> Got her little teepee and her horses took off and <laughs> went to the wolf mountains where they would hide now all summer. But uh, the <clears throat> but the police found out about it and and they probably somebody told them they're up there. They would come there, where's the boy? Oh so he's going someplace with his grandma. But they have ways finding out you know. So they found out that he he and his grandma were out in the wolf mouth. So they went up there Looked for them, found them, you know, and uh, found them, and his uh, dad, Yellowtail, kind of followed the police, you know. And then when they found them, uh, <clears throat> he was right there, he rode up, caught up with it. So they took that little boy away, oh, the rope. So they, one of them was going to put him on his back of his saddle and take him clear to Crow, you know. Wolf Pond is over there, about 35 miles, 30 miles. He says, wait a minute. Father said, look, said, 
He's just a baby, yes. I said, I'll take him. I'll take him tomorrow. So, all right. They decided to let him, so I'll bring him in. So the next morning, while well, they took him to Crow. The children were forced to give up their traditional clothing and come to school in the white man's cast-off clothes. The government wanted to break their sense of pride in their traditional ways. The Indian children were told that their clothing and hairstyles were unclean and inappropriate. The boys were particularly humiliated when their long hair and braids were scorned and quickly cut off. Our first resentment was in having our hair cut. It has ever been the custom of Lakota men to wear long hair. On first hearing the rule, some of the older boys talked of resisting, but realizing the uselessness of doing so, submitted. But after being shorn, we felt strange and uncomfortable. Standing bare, Ogalala Lakota. The boarding school at Crow Agency was a mean place, and they were harsh people. They were mean. So it was a terrible place for these kids to go to school there. Chief Medicine Crow took a little boy to school there and uh, left him there, and he was mistreated, and he, I think they killed him. died there. A lot of them died mysteriously there. I think they were punished so hard they got sick. Killed. And during the day, uh, part of the day they have to work, work hard. They had a farm there, that milk house, chickens, and raised garden. They put, put these kids to work, slave labor, you know, child slave labor. So the government employees around there have fresh, fresh eggs, fresh food, and butcher uh, hogs and cattle, uh, cattle, take care of the horses. They were slaves over there. They punish these kids if they speak in the Crow language, make them chew a, a strong soap. And uh, they're not supposed to uh, play Indian games at all. In other words, uh, just forbidden to carry on their, uh, their, uh, their native cultural ways. Try to tell them, it's, uh, that's no good, that's bad. On the reservations, the white men did all they could to make our people turn away from our way of life, our dress, our dances, our language, and even our way of speaking to the Great Spirit. But the spirit of our elders was strong, and their influence with the reservation youth kept our spiritual traditions alive. Regarding the civilization that has been thrust upon me since the days of the reservation, it has not added one whit to my sense of justice, to my reverence for the rights of life, to my love for truth, honesty, and generosity, nor to my faith in Wakantanka, God of the Lakotas. For after all the great religions have been preached and expounded, or have been revealed by brilliant scholars, or have been written in books and embellished in fine words with finer covers. Man, all man, is still confronted with the great mystery. So, if today I had a young mind to direct, to start on the journey of life, and I was faced with the duty of choosing between the natural way of my forefathers and that of the white man's present way of civilization, I would, for its welfare, 
unhesitatingly set that child's feet in the path of my forefathers. I would raise him to be an Indian. Standing bare, Ogallala Lakota. It was a strict period of a cultural transition. However, the intangible things that they had, their values, their religion, their philosophy, they kept them. And if they have to, they go hide and perform some of their ritual. After 1934, when Commissioner of Indian Affairs uh, removed those prohibitions, uh, they could do their <coughs> ceremonial. So they were sun dancing right away. I think they were hiding and doing it anyhow. <laughs> so they took right off with their sun dancing. <laughs> Every tribe, every tribe there is a ceremony that is being held for each season so that it doesn't mean that just one tribe is carrying all the load for all the people. So everyone has a, a, a time when they're, they're praying for, for the world in general. While many pre-reservation spiritual practices were lost, the essentials of the Sundance religion were preserved by the first generation raised on the reservations. Because of their enduring faith in the ways of the people, the Sundance Way continues to be the center of spiritual life for many Plains Indians to this day. The Sioux are raised in the Sundance, and it is the highest expression of our religion. All share in the fasting, in the prayer, and in the benefits. Some in the audience pray along silently with the dancers. Everyone is profoundly involved. And because of this, the Sioux Nation and all of the peoples of the world are blessed by Wakan Tonka. Fool's Crow, Oglala Lakota. The Absaloka Sundance is a source of tremendous strength for our people. All across the High Plains, I see this tradition as being very strong and important in the families and the way in which they carry out their lives. It, it weaves together several really important spiritual traditions, the sweat lodge, the medicine bundles, the vision quest, and it seems to be a very vibrant community. That is, it's dynamic, it's growing. <laughs> Several men and women of the first generation born on reservations wrote about their sense of obligation to preserve the sacred wisdom of the people. They recognized that it was only through the preservation of our spiritual ways that our people would ultimately survive. If our children uh, today, if they can realize that these things are good and that they're from the Creator and that we can be a part of American society, but still hold on to our values and still hold on to our teachings. I think that's, you know, that's something that I would try to get across to the children. Never forget the old tribal ways. Use them. And they're doing it now. So you all see the little kids all dressed up, dancing, parading on horses, going back to the Indian way and enjoying themselves. So they're doing it. And uh, <clears throat> I'm glad to see that, but they're hanging on.
The American Indian people were thrown into a struggle for their very survival. Many tribes were decimated by diseases, killed by war with the settlers, and victims of brutal massacres. The government sought to forcibly destroy the culture of our ancestors and actively tried to convert our people away from our own traditions. But the story of the American Indian did not end there. And although they were ruthlessly pursued and oppressed, many men and women held fast to the spiritual legacy of our ancestors. It is the unquenchable spirit that has saved the Indian. His clinging to Indian ways, Indian thought and tradition that has kept him and is keeping him today. Standing Bear, Ogallala Lakota. The tribal leaders of the first generation born on the reservations across North America endured a relentless assault upon our way of life, but never wavered. They kept the sacred ceremonies alive and formed a bridge between the nomadic days of our people and the life of today's American Indians. These men and women suffered a crushing blow to their way of life, but led our people to an inner triumph, a triumph of the native spirit.